one thing we really talked about is like the state of like women in the base world. Right. Is that something you'd be okay with like to, like, like do you want to dig into that at all is that is that sure are you, okay. i mean if, if you'd like uh, to talk it's about fine it. with me what are your thoughts on just the state of women in the base world in general Welcome to another episode of Contrabass Conversations, your show covering life on the low end of the spectrum. I'm your host, Jason Heath, and we are sharing the story of Rebecca Lawrence today. And I can't believe I haven't done this in almost 400 episodes. Actually chat with someone who's in school, who's a student. I went back through the archives and I looked and I've never done this. And where Rebecca's at in her life, that's the experience of so many people that listen to this show. So Rebecca and I spent some time together at the International Society of Bases Convention this summer, and I thought she'd be a wonderful guest. We break the show into three parts today. Part one, the state of women in the base world. Part two, undergraduate life, the surprises, evolutions, and challenges that Rebecca's faced. And part three, looking into the future, how her thinking has evolved during her time at USC and where she sees herself going. I know you're going to love this show. We also have some wonderful sponsors. We have Upton Bass and the Bass Violin Shop, and you're going to hear more about them later. Part one, the state of women in the bass world. Here's Rebecca sharing her thoughts. I'm really, really proud to be one, and I'm really happy to be one, and I really want to be somebody I think you know at least thinking about my future I want to be somebody that can like empower other women you know to be like oh look at her you know look at what she's doing like I can do that um you know and I know I've had lots of people my you know my very first teacher was a was a woman and like I really look up to people like Nina and uh De Caesar and like Jordan Morton who I think is doing such an amazing creative thing I think you know, like it is, it's 2017. It's like, it's, it's time for women to have like an equal seat at the table. I actually had a really interesting conversation with Brian Perry at ISB the other week where he was like, Rebecca, you know, I have all, all these really talented female bass players that come through BUTI, you know, that come to Tanglewood. Like, you know, I was one of them, you know, whatever, however many years ago. And he said, every summer I have, you know, three or four or five like great female bass players, you know, in high school at BUTI. And like, what happens to them? Where did they go? And I think, yeah, like living with jazz majors, I, I, you know, one of my best friends here is a female jazz guitarist and she has um, definitely, I think we have very similar experiences, but hers is a little more pronounced because so much of the experience in jazz is, you know, just getting the call, you know, like, who you know, you know, who wants to play with you. And a lot of that is defined by like the hang, you know? Yeah. And it's like, I know I love the guys in my studio. They're great, but I don't want to hang out with them all the time. They're, you know, five years older than me and they're all these, you know, dudes and they want to play video games and like do stuff that I don't want to do. And like, I love them and you know, they're great. But you know, my roommate's experience is similar. That's like, she's really, really talented and she's a great musician and a great writer and doesn't, get the same opportunities that her like equally talented male colleagues might get because she doesn't like shed the hang in the same way. And I think that's, you know, might be a big part of what the reason that we're not seeing more women winning auditions every year is, I mean, maybe this is just speculation, but like, I think a lot of women in college are discouraged by the hang and they see, you know, like these big, like surly, like jockey dudes are the guys winning auditions. And, you know, people see that and they're like, Oh, well, you know, okay. I, I'm five feet tall. I, you know, I can't do that. And it's like, no, like you can. I think the like, I think the most important thing is just, you know, to be cognizant of it. And it, it's the same for, you know, like racism in, in, you know, this world and, you know, the same like dealings with people of color and, you know, like LGBTQ people, like all, you know, the whole concept of intersectionality. And like, it's the truth that this, this world is a, you know, a world that really favors like white men. And I think it's just important to be aware of that, you know, when we're hiring, when we're calling people for gigs, when we're, you know, putting together the hangs or, you know, accepting people into our studios. It's like, I think just important to, to be aware that it's, you know, we really cater to a lot of like white men and that we need to be more inclusive of women and of people of color and, um, you know, other minorities like in, you know, in this like classical bass world. I think, you know, the work that Paul's done and that like Carolyn Emery and like Galen, you know, have done with really getting young students set up with good gear and um, starting, you know, young bassists like much, much younger, I think is 
definitely helping to create more more balance and equality in you know students that are coming up their school now. I'd like to also recommend that you check out a wonderful post written by Nina De Caesar. She's one of our past guests. She's a member of the Oregon Symphony. The post is titled, That Thing is Bigger Than You, Why We Need More Female Bassists in Professional Orchestras. This came out recently. There's a link to it in the show notes. So definitely check that out. And we're going to be getting Nina on the show soon to share this post in audio form also. That was part one of our show today. Part two, the undergraduate life. And I think this is so valuable to hear the perspectives of somebody who's actually in the middle of a degree right now. How did Rebecca decide on USC? What's her experience been like? What's been surprising? That's what we're going to dig into in part two of this episode. Let's start with why USC? How did she end up there? Can you just talk through like how you ended up at USC, like when you discovered it and auditioning and that whole thing, maybe? Oh, gosh, I hope I can remember. I mean, I know the summer before my senior year of high school, I went to BUTI, okay. um, yeah. the, the Tanglewood Institute for High Schoolers. Um, and I remember like I had done a lot of kind of like research and, you know, my dad was a huge help and really encouraged me to shoot very high when I was applying for schools. And I knew that I wanted to go to university. Like I was pretty certain that I didn't want like a small conservatory school. You know, I wanted some place that was going to be, um, I guess like more dynamic and like have a lot more opportunities where I'd be meeting people that weren't just studying classical music. I mean, I, really, really wanted to go to Rice. And um, I didn't get past the pre-screen at Rice. And I was like, you know, I, w- I was sad, but I was obviously, I was fine. And then, yes, yeah, so that summer before senior year, I definitely, um, I think was when I first became aware of David. And I went down to LA October of my senior year and had a lesson with him backstage at Disney Hall. And I was so nervous. Oh my God. But he, I mean, he was amazing. And I had just, I felt like a very instant like connection with him and um like a really strong like draw to his teaching style and to uh the city of LA so yeah I I came down in January for my audition and then um heard from David a few days later actually that uh he wanted me in the studio and I was like so excited and so happy that's how Rebecca ended up at USC I think it's great to hear the different paths that we all take in this music world, finding a place to study. It's never or rarely a linear path. So what's that experience been like? What's it like living in Los Angeles, going to a place like University of Southern California, studying with David Allen Moore? Here are her thoughts. USC, you mentioned there's a lot of different music going on there and artists, you know, like in Los Angeles and the film scene and all that. Like what, what's it like as a student there? Like just in terms of like what's going on artistically, maybe musically and otherwise. It's so amazing. I mean, I, I just feel so incredibly lucky to be here. I feel just like so lucky to be an undergrad here because it's enabled me to like do a lot of like gigging and like freelancing as, you know, while I'm still in like a full-time undergraduate schedule, a lot of it literally just through the university, like because there's, you know, such a prestigious film school that's literally like a stone's throw away. So, you know, there'd be a lot of like film scoring sessions that they'll call music students in for like, there's a scoring stage, like literally right on campus. And also the, like the contemporary music division. So, I mean, obviously USC is like very well known, you know, for the classical, like we have Midori, we have Glenn Dictoro, we have Ralph Kirschbaum and David, but there's this also this incredible other side of the music school that has jazz studies and they have a music industry program actually, and like a pop music performance program, like pretty similar to Berkeley School of Music's. And they have some incredibly, like just amazing faculty members there. and. um great students that are in that division. And actually last year I started a club at USC to kind of help, help promote like students from the classical and jazz and pop divisions, like collaborating together more and like playing together more. Pushing too far that extra hour of practice that you think you need, but you may or may not need. And overuse is something that strikes all of us. I've struggled with that. So many past guests have struggled with that. And Rebecca's had that experience too. So here is Rebecca sharing some of her experiences of just overcoming challenges while doing her undergrad degree. 
you mentioned hurting yourself, like, like, like w- whether it's overuse or just feeling overwhelmed or uninspired, like, can you just yeah. like t- talk about some of those times? Cause I think I know we all go through that and it's just, it's, it's so hard to get out of those negative ruts. Yeah. Um, I think, I mean, I can definitely talk about my experience in the last like six months, I think, which is like one of the most powerful ones. And like, I really, really pushed myself this last semester. I took, I think I took three or four summer festival auditions and I auditioned for New World and I did a recital. And a lot of that was like overlapping. Like I pretty much had like a big deadline every month um, for something like that. And like, you know, I realized that when I was working on, you know, New World and like working on these big you know, and like not even that big, like, you know, like just summer festival, like four or five or six excerpts that I was not as inspired as, as when I was working on my recital. And one of the things I played on my recital this year was a Hofmeister third concerto. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Yeah, a little, a little bit. Yeah, definitely his lesser known work. Um, <laughs> um, but David actually has, has a big soft spot for it. And so he gave it to me about a year ago. So at the, at the beginning of last summer, and I learned the first movement of it last summer when I was at Aspen and I was like pretty uninspired by it. And I realized, you know, I wasn't really enjoying working on it uh, and it took me a really long time to learn and it just like never sounded the way I wanted it to sound. And I was, you know, always just kind of frustrated with it. And then so after, you know, h- taking this auditions and like being kind of in that state of frustration with, with myself and with my instrument, I decided to learn the rest of the concerto by ear, actually. So I didn't look at the music. Uh, I, you know, I, I transcribed it and then I made like charts for it. But I actually didn't look at the music until I started playing it with piano. And it like totally changed everything. Like I loved learning it by ear because I felt like I was learning music and like learning phrases and like learning things in a way where it made sense as like a like a musical sentence or a musical you know, like expression, I guess. And so I, I learned the rest of my recital by ear too. Um, so I learned like a Rachmaninoff piece and then, um, I transcribed some, some Edgar Meyer stuff and I did all of it by ear and got to play. I played like with a bluegrass, uh, quartet, you know, like mandolin, fiddle, guitar, for, you know, for the Edgar Meyer stuff. And like, that was just like such a blast for me. And it was the first time I'd really gotten to, to do that. And it was just so fun, you know, and like people really liked it. That was part two, Undergraduate Life. Before we jump into part three, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Upton Bass String Instrument Company. And I'm so thrilled to be talking about Upton again after all these years. If you go back into the archives of the podcast, you'll see that Upton sponsored the podcast back in the early days. And it's been so fun following along with them and how they've evolved making basses. And so many of our past podcast guests actually play on Upton basses. Craig Butterfield, David White, they both play Upton basses. And you know who else plays an Upton bass? Gary Carr. In fact, Gary Carr has an Upton model, the Carr model Upton double bass. This bass actually won the 2009 silver medal in tone. And I'd like to play a quick clip, and you can hear the whole version of this on YouTube. There's a link to it in the show notes, but I'm playing a quick clip here of David Murray at the 2013 ISB convention. He's auditioning the car Upton bass. Here's a clip. Check out the show notes for a link and be sure to visit UptonBase.com. Check out the car model Upton Base and everything else that they've got going on there at Upton. And I'd also like to thank the Bass Violin Shop. And if you are looking for a double bass rental and you're in the Southeast, be sure to get in touch with the Bass Violin Shop. They offer a variety of rental options for seasoned musicians or first timers. So if you're looking for a bass for a student, that's a great place to look. If you're in town, in North Carolina or anywhere in the vicinity, if you're touring with your group, attending a festival or workshop and you need a bass, the Bass Violin Shop is a great place. So be sure to get in touch with them, give them a call, visit them online for a short-term rental. And you can go to BassViolinShop.com. Okay, 
part three of our story today. How has Rebecca's thinking evolved during these years in her undergraduate degree and what's she seeing in her future? Maybe like think about like walking in freshman year and what you were thinking you were going to do after USC and maybe like now, like has that changed at all for you? Like what you're thinking in terms of the future? <laughs> it's actually funny because I had this conversation pretty recently with my dad. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and yeah, I mean, like when I showed up at USC in the beginning of my freshman year, I was like adamant that I was going to win an orchestra job. And, um, you know, I told that to my parents. And I was like, I'm going to win an orchestra job. I'm going to USC. I'm going to win an orchestra job. And my dad thinks it's very funny that I entered USC knowing that and I'm walking out of USC having no idea what I'm going to do. <laughs> I mean, like I said, I was I was always like really interested in, and then like love different styles of music. Um, and, you know, immediately freshman year, so the classical program at USC is very, very small, actually, and it's very grad heavy. So actually, when I first got to USC, the first people I was really meeting weren't other classical music majors, they were actually pop majors. So some of my first friends here were people that were in the, the pop music performance program. So I was like playing with them and hanging out with them a lot. And I was like, I remember having like a total existential crisis, like, in the first like two months, don't tell David, I was like, oh my God, I'm going to switch to being a pop major. I mean, I guess it's just, it's like such an environment where people, there's so many very talented people and there's such a, I think a, like a crossroads in LA of jazz and funk and hip hop influence. And also like, you know, folk music and um, it just, I think like a lot of different styles of music coming together in in the city and I, you know, it's also an amazing scene for contemporary classical which is like another thing I'm interested in and like there's yeah I think just like so much going on here and venues that are really willing to support that and I think that's a huge part of it too and you know that that it's an industry and that there are you know producers and you know record labels here and recording studio like all sorts of you know just a crossroads for um that kind of like collaboration and like innovation to happen. What are your thoughts post USC or post senior year, I guess? What do, what are what are some things you're envisioning for yourself? I mean, the the really big next step for me on something that I is kind of um, my project that I'm researching this summer is that I really want to go to Paris and spend a year studying under Francois Rabat. Uh so I'm kind of like working on that right now trying to get some money together um, to do that the year after I graduate. And then hopefully I think I'll come back to L.A. and uh, maybe continue studying under David or audition for some other grad schools. That's a next step that makes a lot of sense. And what a great next step, too, to be able to go to a yeah, place like Paris. Yeah. I've gotten to work with him a few summers at Domaine Forge, and he's just such an iconic figure, I think, in the bass world. And, you know, because he's getting old, it's it just like I feel such a draw, um, draw to that right now. I know it's the kind of thing where it's like if I didn't do it right now. I would be kicking myself the rest of my life. And I've also always had like a, a travel bug. I love to travel. And I was super jealous of my friends at USC that like aren't music majors that got to study abroad. Um, and so I, you know, like to have my little form of, of study abroad. Let's say you went and you'll probably do this at some point in your life. But let's say you went back to the Seattle Youth Symphony right now and you were going to give a talk to... <laughs> seniors thinking about going on into music like what would that talk be about <laughs> it's actually funny because I'm, I'm actually going back this summer to be like a fellow at marrowstone where i went when i was 12 oh whoa okay wow okay <laughs> so um i guess i i get to to have some form of that like experience okay um, okay in the flesh but i think i would say you know it's like really go after the music that that you love to play, like play the stuff that you love to play. Obviously there's, there's value in playing stuff that, you know, might be a challenge or something that, that you don't, I guess like quite, you know, grasp completely. But like, I think working on music, like especially solo rap and learning just like tunes, like fiddle tunes and like jazz tunes that I love. It makes me like so excited to like put my hands on my instrument every day. At, you know, at, at least at the place where I'm at, you know, right now where I'm it's summer and I'm not, you know, on so much of a schedule right now. And like my practice day has been a lot of like listening and like transcribing and like then getting in the room, you know, later in the day and just, you know, doing technique stuff. And then also just, you know, doing playing the stuff that I, that I want to learn and that I'm attracted to. And I think that's so, you know, valuable. And like, I've definitely been 
in places, you know, where I was taking auditions for summer festivals or whatever. And I was just like, you know, faced with such a huge list of excerpts that I didn't feel any inspiration from. And I think that's, you know, those are the times when I've like hurt myself in the practice room where I've just gotten really burned out and like not, you know, dreaded, you know, playing my instrument. And that's like, I think such a, a sad and dark place to be is like, when you know your time with your instrument is is fueled by the ego and like fueled by a desire to succeed like to get something to win an audition and like I just try to like to have my time with my bass be as like authentic as possible and like you know to like just like be happy and like feel the joy of like playing my instrument when I'm playing my instrument. Be happy and feel the joy of playing your instrument. It's such beautifully put, simple sentiments, but isn't that what it's all about, folks? Anyway, love those perspectives. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for being on the show. I love that we finally had, after, again, almost 400 episodes, somebody who's in school. I went back in the archives, like I said at the beginning, and I did find one episode called Student Speak Out. This was early in the show, maybe episode number 60 or 70. I don't have it in front of me right now. But it was with a crew of high school students that were participating in the Midwest Young Artist Program. It's a wonderful youth organization, youth orchestra organization in the Chicago area. And several of these people have gone on to do some significant things in the music world. And it's fun to tune back in and listen to their thoughts. You know what? I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. I hope your summer's going well. If you're listening to this right now, if you're listening to them in the future, thanks for finding this episode. If you enjoyed this episode, and this is what we do every week here at Contrabase Conversations, share it out. I'm sure you're on Facebook. Maybe you're on Twitter. Maybe you're on some other social media site that 10 years in the future, people are using instead of those. But regardless of where you hang out online, share this episode. That's what helps this show grow. If you've got a friend that you think would love to listen to this, and I'm sure you have somebody in your life that hasn't listened to this show before and that would benefit from it, forward it to them. You can go on our website. There's even a little button. You can forward an email. If you use our Contrabase Conversations app, you can forward it right within the app. By the way, we have an app. Did you know that? It's at ContrabaseConversations.com slash app, or you can just go on iOS or Android or Kindle even, whatever, and search for the show name or double bass, frankly, and it'll come up. That's a way you can get the show and some bonus content and sheet music within the app and a copy of my book, Road Warrior Without an Expense Account in the app, all sorts of good stuff. So pick up the app. It's free, of course, and let me know what you think. And if you have any thoughts you'd like to share, that could be a topic idea. That could be a guest idea. I am so open to that. That's how I get ideas for every show I do these days. That's how I got the idea for this show. You can email me, feedback at contrabaseconversations.com. I get messages every day from people across the world, and I love hearing from people that listen to this show, and I respond to every message I get. It might take me a day or two, <laughs> but I will get back to you. Thank you so much for tuning in. More great content coming here every week as we continue to explore life on the low end of the spectrum.